What causes a person to kill their entire family? Is it violent video games or movies? Is it music with violent lyrics? No. Usually it's because they're either evil or because of unchecked, undiagnosed mental health issues. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Odal family murders. Viewer discretion is advised. Thomas Odell was the oldest son of Robert and Carolyn Odell, and they lived in Mount Vernon, Illinois. Thomas was born on December 20th, 1966. His mother, Carolyn, was, and this is all according to him, by the way, this is all coming from Thomas himself. His mother was allegedly an abusive parent, typically emotionally abusive and not so much physically abusive. Her behavior allegedly stems from her own childhood where she was mentally and physically abused by her father. A lot of the time when this happens, it tends to get passed down, so to speak. Thomas's father, Robert, he was considered the gentle parent, if you will, like the good cop versus the bad cop. He never laid a hand on the kids. He never, you know, emotionally abused them. That being said, he knew and heard everything that his wife was doing to Thomas. And quite honestly, he just kind of stood by. Carolyn wouldn't allow Thomas to have friends over. He also wasn't allowed to go to other friends' houses. He really wasn't allowed to be a kid. When Thomas, and he usually went by Tom, when he was about five years old, his sister, Robin, was born. And Robin, she got much, much different treatment from her mother. When Robin came into the picture, Carolyn became more physically abusive towards Thomas and also very restrictive. So whenever like Carolyn and Robin were with each other, like in the living room or in the kitchen, Thomas was not allowed to go in there while the two of them were. If he tried, he would get hit or he would at least get yelled at very harshly. And then in 1972, um, Sean was born and this was Thomas's first brother. And Sean, being a boy and clearly Carolyn was not fond of having boys, he got the same treatment that Thomas did as he was, you know, growing up. It was said that Sean was just flat out not wanted by Carolyn. Now I want to reiterate, this is all coming from the mouth of Thomas. Um, and by the end of the story, you're gonna have to take that with a grain of salt. Thomas said that because Carolyn just didn't really care about Sean and or Thomas um, and didn't really want to care for him, basically Thomas had to help raise Sean. Um, and meanwhile, Robert, the father, again, allegedly is just sort of there. Um, not really participating much, according to Thomas. And then in 1975, Scott was born, another boy. I don't know why Carolyn um, tried to have more kids. If she didn't want to have boys, you know, you run the risk. So I'm not, I'm not sure why she would continue that. But unfortunately, no one can ask her um, and no one can corroborate really any of this. There was a point when the Child Protective Services were actually brought to the Odal home, which means there is some credence to what Thomas said about physical abuse. And actually at one point, the youngest brother, Scott, was removed from the home, but then they returned him back to the family. Thomas said that Sean was chained up at points of the day. And this was because Carolyn did not want Sean to eat any food 
um, in the middle of the night. So she literally chained him to a wall. Eventually, Tom says he was then chained to walls for two to four hours each day for a couple days a week. Why? Just because, I guess. Because Tom really never had a genuine childhood. Because he was allegedly abused physically, emotionally. This took a humongous disturbing toll on his own mind, his psyche. Very likely, he developed PTSD. So as a teenager, he became a troublemaker. He broke into neighbors' homes and stole things. He said he fell heavily into drugs like, you know, marijuana, but then also cocaine and heroin and also alcohol. And this kind of behavior he brought back to the home. According to Robert, the father, according to Robert's brother, um, Tom was creating some major issues in the home because of all of this alcohol and drug abuse. He then got in trouble with the law for having sexual intercourse with younger girls. Uh, when he was between 16 and 18 years old, he would have sex with like much, much younger girls, and one of them got pregnant. The girl was essentially forced to have an abortion. What they did was they let him go into the military instead of facing charges for like statutory sexual assault. After he was honorably discharged from the military, he got home, he couldn't find himself a job. He tried, but no one would hire him. Tom had no plans for the rest of his life. He had no aspirations. He had no dreams of the future. He had nothing. Um, he was mainly caught up in his own mind, trying to get rid of that mental pain, um, especially the pain of his past, by continuing to use alcohol and drugs. He moved back in with his parents and Again, with all of this behavior still occurring, they told him, because he was 18 at this point, you have to move out of this house. We're giving you until 4 p.m. on Friday, November 8th, 1985, and you need to be gone. This caused Tom to have violent outbursts towards his parents, but especially his mother. He was essentially taking out aggression that, you know, towards her from everything from his past. He said later on that he actually planned to end his own life in front of his family on that Friday. But his plans changed, apparently. According to Tom, on November 8th, 1985, he awoke at about 9.30 in the morning. He had a cigarette outside of the house. He then walked into the kitchen where his father was sitting down. At the time, his father was the only one in the house because everyone else was out. Um, his dad was just reading the newspaper, drinking some coffee, the normal stuff. Tom went over to the counter. He grabbed a knife. He slid it into his pockets, and then he was going to walk upstairs. But then he changes his mind. Tom walks back down the stairs, walks up to his father, unbeknownst to him and just completely oblivious, to Tom, Tom took out the knife from his pockets and he just stabbed his father directly in the throat. Robert slouched over and fell to the ground, but he was not dead at the time. He then began to crawl towards the phone and Tom then took the knife and began to stab him in the throat again, repeatedly until his father was dead. He then took his dad's body dragged him all the way upstairs to the master bedroom where the parents slept and he just sort of dumped his father's body in the bathroom. He then just casually goes back downstairs, cleans himself up a little bit, sits down in the kitchen and just waits. Waits for his mom to come back home. When Carolyn walks into the house, she did not stand a chance. Um, he ambushed her from behind and stabbed her once in the neck as well. 
He then forced her to go upstairs while she was bleeding um, and showed her her husband's body and forced her to look at it. And then at that point, you know, as she's screaming and crying, he then begins to cut and slash at her throat until she is dead. Then he tidies up. He leaves his mother's body just sitting there on the master uh, bedroom floor. He, you know, cleans up his hands, changes his clothes. He then goes to meet a girlfriend of his who is, by the way, he's 18. She is a couple years younger, so he hasn't gotten away from that either. Tom just had lunch with her and then they met some friends and they hung out for a bit um, just in time for elementary school to let out. Tom went back home. His younger brother Scott walked in. He noticed the kind of blood in the kitchen like sprayed on the walls and he's like uh what's this about? Tom's like oh don't worry we're just we're painting um so don't yeah it's fine. His 10 year old brother bought it and then Tom would just walk up to him put his hands around his younger brother's throat squeezed and strangled him um, and it wasn't really working so he grabbed a pair of pajama pants and he tied that around his brother's neck and he squeezed and choked him until he was dead as well he then realizes oops Carolyn, my mom, is supposed to go pick up the other two kids from their school at this point. Oops, what do I do? Well, he just got into the car, his mother's car, drove to the school, and he picked up Sean and Robin. And he just drove them home and apparently had like a good normal conversation in the car on the way back to the house. Um, when they got inside, Robin went to her room, so she kind of avoided all of the, the gross you know, murder stuff. Um, and what Tom did is he said, hey, Sean, I have a really cool surprise for you, uh, but do you need to close your eyes? So he put a, like a bandana or something around his brother's eyes. Um, and then he kind of guided him towards the master bedroom. When Tom and his now 13 year old brother, Sean got there, he took off the blindfold and he showed him the bodies of his mother and father. Before Sean could really do anything to react, Tom grabbed out a knife from his pocket and slashed into his neck and cut his throat. Sean slumped to the ground. Tom thought he was dead. Tom starts to walk out of the master bedroom, but then he hears Sean rustling about. So he goes back into the room where Sean is struggling to live. He takes a knife and then he stabs his 13 year old brother directly in the head. Um, a couple of times until he knows this time he is dead. He then goes to Robin's bedroom where she is blissfully unaware of all the things that have happened. And he does the same trick with her. Hey, I have a surprise for you. It's really cool. It's in mom and dad's room. Um, we want to show you something. So he blindfolds her, brings her to the master bedroom where apparently she says kind of uh, snarkily, Ugh, this better be a good surprise. So Tom takes off the blindfold shows her the carnage and he says the fear in her eyes was i guess nice for him to see um and then he just took out the knife and stabbed her to death she was 14 years old he then i guess at this point didn't bother to clean up since no one else was coming home and he just goes you know what cool now he leaves the house and he goes and meets his friends later that evening. They go out and get some food, they drink, they stay at a local hotel and just have fun like nothing happened. Well, by the next day when Robert's co-workers realize he's not here, in fact, no one is where they're supposed to be. Many people are called um, and eventually the police are informed that all of these people have not shown up to where they're supposed to be. Can we go do a wellness check? So they get to the house and they discover the just unbelievable carnage um, in the master bedroom. Police found out that Tom, because they didn't see Tom there, that he had gone to a hotel with his 15 year old girlfriend. So they went to the hotel and when Tom walked out, he was arrested right then and there. And didn't take Tom long. He just said, yeah, I did it. I killed all of them. Like just, 
He apparently was very cold. He had no reaction. He showed zero remorse. He even seemed kind of proud of what he did to his family. The parents were kind of considered very well respected in, in the city, in that area. Um, and so when this information came out eventually that Carolyn was, you know, this abusive mom, people were having a hard time believing it. Um, it, it when Tom was obviously forced to see a psychiatrist to, te to determine whether he was sane at the time of the murders and if he can stand trial. And, you know, the, the psychologist he saw, it sounded, basically, it sounded very legit. He came to the conclusion that the abuse was real. Uh, it was happening. You know, you partner what this, you know, these sessions with the fact that Child Protective Services was called to the home. You know, the youngest brother was taken out of the home at a certain point. And so it all, it did add up. I mean, the abuse was likely very real. But it didn't appear that anyone kind of in the family social circle, the family for outside the house, that they really had any idea anything like that was happening. But that's actually pretty common. Tom would go on trial, and this was in 1986, and it was, you know, about a week or two long, like typical trials. The jury was in and out in less than two hours, where they found him guilty of the murder of all five family members. And obviously he admitted to it. Um, really the trial was more about was he sane and aware of it. And ultimately they all determined that yes, you know, he was very aware of what he was doing. He was sane at the time. He was diagnosed as having borderline personality disorder, some levels of PTSD. Um, and all of this was determined to stem from the physical abuse from his mother. The signs were kind of always there, but no one thought at the time, like, maybe we should get him in to get some help. You know, maybe we should, I don't know, like, he, it, it just didn't appear to be that anyone cared or noticed that he was obviously going through some things. In the end, ultimately, Tom Odell is a monster. Um, he made the decision, the calm, calculated, and cold decision to murder his entire family, including his child siblings. Nowadays, when this kind of stuff happens, we're quick to blame things like violent video games, or blah, 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 movie, or this music was oh, a lot of like talking about abuse and murders and stuff. So it must be that, right? You know, I have uh, PTSD from other, for other reasons, obviously. Um, but I also play super violent video games. I watch violent movies and TV shows, and I listen to music with a lot of violent lyrics, and a lot of people do. So ultimately, it's that person's individual brain, right? Something in that person's brain isn't right. And when it goes unchecked, things like this happen. Um, it is Tom's fault. Everything that occurred with this murder, 100% Tom's fault. Um, it's just one of those things where, though, like, had he been raised differently, would this have still happened? Um, you know, I, I'm not at all victim blaming here because his mother did not deserve what she got, in my opinion. Um, there were, there are other ways of handling stuff like this. You go to the authorities, you let them know what's been happening. Um, you tell CPS, this is what's happening. You don't murder your family, you just don't. So there's something in a person's brain that doesn't know or doesn't care about doing the right thing. It's just, let's do murder, right? Five people didn't get to live out their lives as was intended it was taken from them in a very brutal fashion. When Tom was convicted, there was the options of sentencing him to life in prison without parole or giving him the death penalty. His defense argued, you know, yes, he did these horrible things, but he did so because 
of the abuse. He did so because of blah, blah, blah. So he shouldn't give the death penalty. But the jury disagreed. <laughs> the jury sentenced him to death. Um, and he was waiting on death row for over a decade before the Illinois governor at the time. Basically, they um, got rid of the death penalty because of a string of wrongful convictions that had happened. So they abolished the death penalty. So Tom was then resentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And because of his actions, that is exactly where he deserves to be. That is it for today's video. Um, I hope you found it, the story interesting. Um, if you guys have a case you would like me to cover, you can please email me um, the case you want me to cover. If you first go to my link tree, which is in my uh, description below, go to, I think the f second, third or fourth link down, it says like crime or case list. Um, scroll through the list, it has like 4,100 names on it at this point. Um, and if you don't see the name you want me to cover, uh, then you can email me the name. The email is in that document. It's also, I'll put it in the description below and, or it's just truecrimer at gmail.com. Um, just a quick email, just the name, when it happened and, you know, where it happened, if you know those details, um, and I'll add it to the list. Keep in mind, I choose these cases very randomly. Um, so your case could get covered three days from now or two and a half years from now. I just, I choose randomly to be fair. Most of the cases that I have on my list come directly from you guys. Um, so I want to be fair by just choosing them randomly. Um, lastly, if you would like to support me in any way, you can purchase some of our merch, uh, which is also in the link tree. We sell shirts that say like, hello, true crimers, or we just sell shirts with like just my logo, you know, the, the name of the page. Uh, we sell hoodies. Um, you can do like rainbow font to support the LGBT aspects of me um, <laughs> or you. We have these little wine glasses that say making a true winer. -er. <laughs> so you can get those um, in uh, the merch store. So yeah, that's just, and we do ship internationally, by the way. I forgot to mention that in my other videos, but he, my, the guy who makes my merch, Adam, whose TikTok is logically.me. Um, he makes all my merch and he ships it out to wherever you live. So if you live in Europe or South Africa or wherever. That is it for today's video. Um, we will see you for the next one. And until then, ta-ta for now. Whoa, disappearing. True crime aroonies.